Good morning. My name is Pastor Jim Baugh. I am so glad to be with you. I'm in a hotel in California, having just returned from Africa a few days ago, and I'm at a conference uh, in, uh, in California. It's a beautiful day. And I'm so glad that you joined me to uh, hear the Word of God this morning on this day of worship. I want to tell you that uh, God answered some wonderful prayer while in Africa, and I'm thankful to be able to share uh, God's message with you today. Let's pray before we begin. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come boldly before your throne, thanking you for the opportunity to serve you. And we pray today as we recount your faithfulness and your plan and purpose for our lives that, Lord, you'd, you'd just encourage us with your word as well as empower us to accomplish the plan that you have for us as we wait for your coming, Jesus. We love you and thank you in your name. Amen. Well, many people are searching for purpose in life, and the question I bring to your attention this morning is uh, simply this, what in the world is God doing? And not only what in the world is God doing in the world today, because folks are filled with fear and anxiety and all the things that take place because of the news cycles and stuff that's happening. But uh, the question we have is this, will God accomplish his plan and purpose? Will the world be reached with God's good news? I mean, Jesus made some promises, didn't he? He said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached uh, and to the ends of the earth and then the end shall come. Well, is this gospel of the kingdom the same gospel that we're called to share with others. You know where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I gave to you the gospel which Christ himself gave to me, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that the third day he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. Is that the message of the king, or the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus was speaking of? And is it, is it also consistent to say that when everyone across the world hears the gospel that the end will come. Certainly there have been many people who have uh, said, you know, I think Jesus is coming is soon. And I just want to tell you this, every day that clicks off brings us closer to the return of Jesus. We do see things happening in the world today that are, are fulfillment of, of prophecy, of fulfillment of the signs of the times. And we ask ourselves the question, wow, is this the time for the return of the Lord? And what should we do as we wait? You remember the great commission that Jesus gave to his disciples and then ascended um, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. You know, Jesus said that as you are going, you were to make disciples both, uh, well, in Acts, he said, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost. But in Matthew 28, he said, of every ethnic group, of every nation, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to what? Observe everything that I have commanded you. And then Jesus gave this promise, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. My question is, is this, will God accomplish that promise, that purpose that he gave to his disciples before he ascended into glory? The answer is found in scripture, actually. And we have two places that I want to take a look at. Uh, the first is Revelation chapter, chapter 5, verse 9. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. This is the account that the Apostle John records for us when he was taken up into heaven and shown the things that are yet to come to be. Now, there are some people who view the book of Revelation um, in different view, I mean, different hermeneutics, different ways of understanding the book of Revelation. And some of you this morning might say, man, I don't even want to talk about the book of Revelation because it's so difficult to understand. And it, it is a challenging book. But the reality of it is, is that the truths of the book of Revelation are very, very pointed uh, for our own lives today. And we need to understand what the book is speaking of. 
So the Bible says that John is taken up for this glimpse of what <clears throat> is to come, the things that were, the things that are, and the things that are yet to come. And so in Revelation 5, 9, we see a vision of what is yet to come. And John says <clears throat> in verse 9, and they sang a new song. Now, who's they? It's all these individuals who are before the throne of God, and they're singing in heaven this song. Worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain. They're speaking to Jesus. You were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. And here's, here's the kicker. From every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and a priest and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This is a proclamation of praise from all these people who are, um, who are before the throne of God, singing, Lord, the Lamb of God, Jesus, you are worthy to take the scroll. What scroll? The scroll that was to be unrolled or unveiled concerning the things that are yet to come, those prophetic things that are yet to come, and they say that, that they're, they're worshiping him because he was slain. And by his blood, this is the message of the gospel, that Christ gave his, his body on the tree and he shed his blood as payment for our sin. The Bible says without the payment, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And God in Christ shed his own blood on the cross to pay the payment for the sins of the world. And it's only applied, that payment is only applied to everyone who believes. See, So they're crying out, you are worthy to receive the praise and the glory. You're worthy to open the scroll that will unveil to us what is yet to come about. For you ransom people from God. You, you bought them. The word ransom is literally the payment made to buy them out of the slave market of sin. And so Jesus, through his blood on the cross, paid the penalty to ransom us out of the slave market of sin and who, who are the recipients of this gracious gift? People from every tribe and language and nation uh, and, and people. It, that reminds me of Matthew 28, doesn't it? Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, of every, the word there is ethnos, every ethnic group. And they are saying that the lamb is worthy because he did this so that this would happen. And then we find another passage of scripture that gives the fulfillment of this uh, blessed command that Jesus gave to us in Matthew 28. You are my disciples. You are to make disciples. And it says in Matthew 28, verse 9, um, that after a time of tribulation takes, takes place, we have the the calling of the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7. People say, who are the 144,000? You know, Jehovah's Witnesses claim that they're the 144,000, but I'm sorry, they're not, because unless they're of the tribe of tribes of Israel, um, and by the way, why would they be knocking on your door wanting you become a part of the 144,000? Because if you add more, that kind of ruins their chance, right, to be a part. I mean, the more people there are, the less chance, okay, you get the logic on it. So Jehovah's Witnesses are not part of the 144,000. Um, that's false teaching. But here it is, after these, um, these great evangelists and servant of God to take place during the tribulation period are called out from the existing and, in essence, the, uh, the tribes of Israel that still exist in the world today, um, it says this, after this I looked, look at verse 9 of chapter 7. John says, after this I looked, and behold, a multitude that no one could number. Now, some people say, what is heaven going to be like? I'll tell you what it's going to be like. It's going to be awesome. And there will be more people there than you could ever imagine who have by faith in Christ alone come to know the living God and know life eternal. And it says, a great multitude that no one could number, 
some individuals state that that heaven and the the measurements of heaven that are lined out at the book at the uh, in in the book of Revelation um, that heaven will be big enough to contain more people than have ever been born on this planet. The Bible says in the book in the book of First Peter that God is not willing, chapter three, that God is not willing that any should perish and that all should come to repentance. There will be a great number above the number you can number. I mean, there's so many people that you just can't, you know, sit there and count them on your fingers and toes, all right? from But where are they from? From every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. What does that mean? It means they've been washed. They've been redeemed. They are part of the family of God with palm branches in their hands. Do you remember the palm branches on Palm Sunday where all those in Jerusalem were there uh, at, uh, the, at the feast and they're waiting for Jesus to come and Jesus comes on a donkey on the foal of an ass and they're, and they're waving their palm branches saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now, save us now. And then just a few days later, they're saying, crucify him, crucify him. But here they are, this waving of palm branches is the welcoming of a king and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels are standing around the throne and all the, around the elders, the four living creatures, they fell on their face before the throne and they worshiped God saying, amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And John um, is addressed, one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And I said, sir, you know. In other words, this man is asking a rhetorical question. He says, John, who are these people and where did they come from? John says, you know, there's a smile on his face. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. What's my point? My point is, is that God's redemptive plan and purpose will be fulfilled. God's going to do it. And he's just inviting us to be a part of the process. It's sort of like being on a winning team. I mean, you know, if you're a good coach, you want to paint the picture for your teammates or for the guys on your team that, hey, this, this game is already won. All you need to do is win it. But the point is, is that God, the who's above time and space, the sovereign one who declares what is and what shall be and, and what shall not be, has, has called us to be a part of his work. Jesus said, go into all the world as you are going into the world. Jesus assumed and knew that we would be going. Where would we be going? Well, we'd be going to play golf. We'd be going to school. We'd be going to work. We'd be going to the grocery store. We'd be going to our families, our friends. We would be going. And as we are going, what are we to do? Make disciples. Make disciples. We are to win people to Christ, to build them up in the faith, and then send them out to accomplish that process again. And so Jesus told us what to do. He told us where to go. He said, first of all, you know, go to Jerusalem. He tells his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Where's, are you, some people say, are you telling me I got to go to Jerusalem to begin my evangelism ministry? No, your Jerusalem is the place that's closest to you, right? Your Jerusalem are the people across the street, the people down the road. I remember in the Gospels where Jesus cast a thousand demons out of the demoniac. Do you remember that? Um, and the, the demons cried out, you know, what are we to do with you, O Son of God, and so forth. And, and Jesus, <clears throat> it's, it, it takes place, let's see, there's a little spider right there. I'm going to take care of that guy. 
Um, yeah, in Matthew 28, you have your Bibles. Let's let's look at that. Um, when he came to the other side, the county, the the country of the the Gadarenes, two demon possessed men met with him, coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass by. Um, and they, Jesus cast the demons out of these uh, or this demon possessed guy. And so after that happens, the guy says, I want to follow you. It's a really interesting passage. And Jesus says this. He says, go back to your village and tell them what I've done for you. And I think that's what Jesus means in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when he says, go to your Jerusalem. Go back to your people. Um, you know, a thousand miles does not a missionary make. If, if you can't share your faith with those close to you, effectively, then how are you going to share your faith with others across the seas? I mean, it's sort of a, um, I think, a, a, a ministry cop-out where people say, well, I can, I can go over there and talk about Jesus, but I can't do it where I'm living. And Jesus wants us to go where we're living and to share with those who are willing and open to hear. So think about this, men and women, you're listening this morning. Do you have grandchildren who don't yet know the Lord Jesus? Can you share your testimony of faith with them? Uh, maybe you can just let them know you're praying for them and that you love them and, and have opportunity, again, to tell your testimony how you met Christ. You could be that missionary for those grandkids that perhaps don't have the opportunity to hear from their mom and dad. Maybe it's the neighbor next door. Maybe it's the person down the road. I'm not saying that this is simply an easy process, but I'm saying that no one can doubt your personal testimony. I really encourage people when they're developing their personal testimony and their God story to do it in this way. And let me give it to you. All right, you ready? You got maybe a pencil, you can write it down. Share, uh, share the story of your life before you met Christ. And then you can share when you met Christ and how that took place. And then now that you know Christ. And that's really your God story, your testimony. Paul uses a testimony numerous times in the scripture. He uses it in the book of Acts. He uses it in the book of Philippians. He uses his testimony in the book of Galatians. And so consider writing your own testimony and being prepared to give an answer to those who ask you concerning the hope that lies within you, yet with gentleness and reverence. You might say to your grandchildren, did I ever tell you how uh, I came to know Christ and how Jesus has brought life and meaning and transformation and forgiveness in my heart? Um, I often encourage people to write their testimony with a theme, um, something that really drew you to Christ and impacted your life for his glory. For me, it was the assurance of eternal life. I mean, I was raised in a Christian home and I, I heard the gospel, but I had never yet responded personally to it. And, and that whole idea of where I'm going to spend eternity was the hound of heaven that, that pursued me until I came to know Jesus. And so that's my testimony, how I came to know that I have eternal life. And I can share with them how I came to know. And before I met Christ, I didn't have the assurance of eternal life. And when I met Christ and put my trust in him, he gave me that assurance through the pages of his truth, the promises of his word. And now that I know Christ, that assurance of eternal life gives me a, a, a hope, an unshakable confidence for what lies ahead in the future. For I know that when my life is over here, it will begin in glory. And that, men and women, is a great story to tell to people who are wondering what's beyond this life. Okay? So that's your God story. And that's your Jerusalem. As God uses you in your Jerusalem, he might send you to the Samaria. He might send you to the Judea, uh, to the uttermost. And that's really the story of my life, is that when I made a commitment to Christ, I said, Lord, I need to take care of my Jerusalem and begin to share thy testimony of faith with those who are closest to me. 
and then God enabled me to, to do some ministry outside of my home. And now I have opportunity to share the good news of Jesus globally around the world. And I'm able to share it with you this morning. And I'm so glad. So this is the message of the gospel. And this is what God has promised that he will do and is doing around the world says in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 that there will be people from every tribe and language and nation before the throne of God singing worthy is the lamb that was slain. You might ask the question where does this heart for missions and for God come from? Did you know that God throughout the Bible has demonstrated a passion for reaching the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, Christ was God's great missionary to a lost world. Jesus said, even as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And this is interesting. I want to share just a moment with you. The word missionary comes from the Latin word missios, and you can hear it. Missios means to be sent. Um, we get the word mission from that. You know, you're going to go on a, on a mission. You know, Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible. Well, this is Mission Possible with God. And so that word mission comes from the Latin word missios, which means to be sent. Now, the Greek word for mission or to be sent is the word apostolos, from which we get the word what? Apostle. Now, when I'm talking about apostles, there were the apostles that Jesus chose, right? The 12 apostles. We would refer, I would refer to those as apostles with a capital letter A. Um, and one of them was a failure, Judas. This is just encouragement and hope for all of us who share the gospel with others and all of us who share our God story with others that there will be people who, who follow along and they, they want to know more about Jesus, but they don't continue in the faith. In fact, Jesus talked about this in the parable of the sower and the soils. He said, you know, there's, there's a rocky soil. There's the soil that gets caught up in the weeds. There's the, um, the soil that the seed of the gospel is, is thrown on and the birds come and Satan comes and steals the seed. And then there's the solid soil that receives the seed and produces a, an abundant harvest. And so I just want you to know that not everyone that you share your testimony with or even seek to, to win to faith in Christ is going to follow Christ. That's the reality of this, the, uh, the parable of the soils. It's also the reality of the parable, or excuse me, of the truth of discipling someone or sharing the good news with someone. There is going to be failure. Not everyone is going to follow. God does not say in his word that everyone, the sense of what's called universalism, that everybody in the whole wide world will be saved. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that whoever shall, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the Bible also tells us in Revelation 7, 9, that there will be beyond count the number of people from every tribe and language and nation, ethnos, ethnic group, will be before the throne of God in fulfillment of Jesus' command in Matthew 28. But where did this mission heart come from? Well, it comes from God. It didn't start in the New Testament. It didn't start with the Apostle Paul. It started with God. In fact, God's thoughts are fully expressed in his mission heart in John 3, 16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he, what, gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's the central text of the Bible. That, in essence, is the Bible in one verse. It's also the cornerstone of God's heart and passion for the world. There are other texts. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's verse 17 of John 3. Also in 1 John 2, 2, it says, Jesus Christ is the atonement, atoning sacrifice for our sins. He is the propitiation. He is the payment, the satisfactory payment for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for the what? Sins of the whole world. 
in John chapter 1, verse 29, John the baptizer sees Jesus coming and he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away what? The sin of the world. From the beginning of history, even God's creation, God's plan was the redemption or the opportunity for the redemption of the whole world. Listen, listen in Acts chapter 17, verse 26 and 27. It says, He created all the people of the world from one man, Adam, and scattered the nations across the face of the earth. You remember the book of Genesis that they didn't want to be scattered, and God scattered them. His purpose in all of this was that they should seek after God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. The authority of missions rests on the entire word of God. From the beginning of time, God's plan was to win the world and to multiply those who follow him. In fact, in Genesis 1.28, he says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful in what? Multiply. God was to bless the whole world. His plan through Abraham and through the seed of Abraham, which is Jesus Christ himself. In fact, in Genesis chapter 12, it's called the Abrahamic covenant. God says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and the entire world will be blessed because of you. Why was Abraham a blessing to the nation? Because through Abraham, Messiah Jesus came, the lineage. God the Son was born, the Son of Man, and he came through Abraham as a fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. God actually sent Abraham as a missionary, and he told Isaac and Jacob that, that, that the blessing on their lives was to be a blessing for the whole world. It says in Genesis chapter 26, they shall be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Elijah excuse me, Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. Elijah was a missionary to the non-Jews. Elisha ministered to Naaman, the Syrian, and, and Naaman came to faith. In fact, think about this. Solomon's prayer at the temple dedication reveals God's plan for the world. Listen to this prayer. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 41 through 43, it says, And when foreigners hear of your great name, and come from distant lands to worship you. Hear them from heaven and answer their prayers, and all the nations of the earth will know and fear your name. The word fear in the Old Testament speaks of a reverential trust and commitment. This call of God to reach the world with the good news comes throughout the whole Bible. The prophet Isaiah said this in Isaiah 49, verse 6, I will make you a light to the nations of the world to bring my salvation to them. And all nations will come to God through the message of the good news. The missionary idea is seen in the Older Testament and it comes to full bloom in the New Testament. One individual said this, his name was W.O. Carver. If there had been no commission or no obedience to his spirit, there would have been no need for the scriptures to be written. Isn't that interesting? The New Testament breathes missions. It creates missions wherever it goes. But that passion to reach the world began in Genesis chapter 1. God loves the world and he loves you. And he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but everlast, have everlasting life. And to those who know Christ, we've been great, given the greatest gift of all. And what are we to do with it? We're to share it with others. I encourage you to develop your personal testimony and share it with someone who's close to you. Or maybe someone who's not so close. But just say, I've been working on God's work in my life in a short, what we call a testimony. May I share this with you? And people will give you the opportunity to share your God story. 
May God bless you. May he use you. May he encourage your heart. And may we be encouraged with the fact that nothing happens by accident. God is on the move around the world. I just got back from Africa where as a result of our, our evangelism training ministry and our discipleship training ministry, we have close to 15 new churches that are ready to be formed just in the last year and a half. There are four new churches in Haiti that are, are forming as well. Uh, our discipleship ministry just broadened to Cameroon. We're now in eight countries of the world. Thank you so much for praying. Thank you so much for partnering. Listen, the light shines the brightest when the night is the darkest. Things are dark right now in the world. The problems in Israel and the warfare and the problems in Ukraine and and there are about 40 wars going on right now in the world. But I want you to know this. God never says oops. And he is accomplishing his plan and his purpose to redeem the world through the good news of Jesus Christ. And he's going to, he's calling us to be a part of that redemption process. Will you be willing to share your story, your God story, with someone this week. I'll close again with these verses. And after this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, every tribe and people and language standing before the throne of God, crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Remember, the future is as bright as the promises of God, and God is at work, and I pray he's at work in you. If I can be of help to you in your spiritual journey, just send me an email, www. Uh, I'm sorry, I just gave you the wrong one. <laughs> it's uh, Jim B at gtn.org. That's all the address you need. Jim B at gtn.org. And I'll be sure to write you back. Let's pray together as we close. Thank you so much for this day, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your willingness to invite us to be a part of your redeeming process. Thank you for what you're doing around the world. And we pray that we might be a part of that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you next week.